Hello, everybody. My name is Alexandra Vakru. I'm the Executive Director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. Thank you for joining us today for what promises to be a very interesting discussion on the economic impact of the war in Ukraine. We're very lucky to have top specialists to discuss what's happening in Ukraine from Ukraine. Uh, an expert on Russia who's been following the economy for many years, uh, both from the inside and from the outside, and also a specialist on Africa who's going to talk to us about the wider ripple effects of the war. So let me introduce all of our guests. Then uh, they're going to give a five to eight minute overview of the situation regarding the uh, area that they study, and then we'll open it up to a discussion and uh, Q&A. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A bar of the, uh, of the Zoom link. So let me start. It's a great honor and pleasure to have Tim Milovanov with us. He is from the president of the Kiev School of Economics and a board member of the National Bank of Ukraine. He is obviously in Ukraine. He's also been a minister of economic development, trade and agriculture of the country. Timofey is a graduate of Kiev Polytechnic Institute and Kiev Mohila Academy, where he majored in economic theory. And he has a PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the United States. He's also one of the founders of the Vox Ukraine platform, which aims to increase the level of economic discussion in Ukraine. And we will provide a link to that uh, in the chat. Maxim Boyko is a visiting lecturer in economics at Harvard University and a senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown. He's a member and the founding chairman of the board of the New Economics School, the leading private Russian graduate school in economics. Maxim has worked for the Russian government, nonprofits and business. During President Yeltsin's second term, he was the deputy minister, deputy prime minister and deputy chief of staff. And he also played a principal role in designing and implementing Russian voucher privatization and macroeconomic stabilization programs. From 1998 to 2010, Maxim was a partner at Video International, Russia's largest private media and advertising group. Maxim has his PhD in economics from the Institute for World Economy and International Relations in Russia and a master's in applied mathematics from the Moscow Institute for Physics and Technology. Finally, Mar Marlis von Weinberg is an assistant professor in the Harvard Business School. She is in the Business, Government and International Economy Unit. Her main research agenda centers on long-term economic, long-term development patterns of African economies, and her projects have focused on material living standards, fiscal capacity building efforts, coercive labor market institutions, and skill accumulation. Marla earned a PhD in history from Northwestern University, and before joining Harvard Business School, she was a postdoctoral scholar in the Michigan Society of Fellows and an assistant professor of economics at the University of Michigan. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. And I'm going to give the uh, virtual floor to Tim to lead us off and talk about what the war, uh, war's impact on the Ukrainian economy has been. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm today I'm in Lviv. Recently, I was in Kiev. Um, I have not been outside of Ukraine since the war began. Um, I came to Ukraine a couple of days before for this, uh, before the war began. Um, so I felt that the risks are there and I had to kind of make sure that the security protocols at the Kiev School of Economics were uh, in place. Unfortunately, it turned out that um, they had to be activated. So it's been two months, uh, slightly over, and you know, it's a little bit all uh, one large blur. Um, and so it's the same for the economy. Yeah, the first two, three weeks was a major shock. Uh, but now it looks like everyone is adapting to the new normal, if we can put it that way. New normal meaning that um, at least people start to realize that it's, you know, there's no hope it's going to be over in a week or two. And unfortunately, maybe not in a month. Uh, and we'll hope it will be some kind of, you know, over at some point. But when, no one, uh, no one wants to really speculate about how long it might go on. So the, the businesses, you know, in the first, uh, we've done surveys and in the first uh, weeks, um, the businesses basically shut down all of them and only about 12% of the service show that only 12% of the businesses continue to pay in salaries. In fact, uh, the universities were among them, <laughs> representing the Give School of Economics, uh, we made the decision to cap salaries, but to continue to pay salaries. So we just didn't know uh, what's going to happen with liquidity. Um, now, you know, it's about two thirds of the businesses are paying 70% or more salaries <laughs> and even more uh, paying mostly all orders of the suppliers. 
And the remaining or main issue that the businesses consider to be a threat is lack of water rather than um, the ability to produce them. This is very interesting from the economic perspective because we have seen two unusual phenomena. One is that this is the lack of orders issue rather than the lack of capacity to produce. Because usually during the war, what you see is that uh, either supply chains are disrupted or the equipment is destroyed or people are missing. That's not what the businesses re re reply in the surveys now. They, only 14% of businesses are showing uh, issues with the supply chains. Yeah, supply chains are problematic. The costs are up. Uh, the time uh, needed to, for things to arrive is up. But... Uh, it's the lack of orders. And the lack of orders can be addressed by the standard macroeconomic and you know, fiscal essential instruments. Uh, the second surprise, very positive surprise, is that the banking system didn't collapse. Mm -hmm. The banking system, the payment system, hasn't stopped operating for a day. And there's actually hasn't been a run on the banks. That's amazing because you know, show, you know, I, I cannot think of a country uh, which for for 60 days has been bombarded bombarded by missiles and it, uh, you know the banks continued to operate and in ATMs there were no uh, no lines and the um, the exchange rate was you know more or less stable there's a difference of course between the official exchange rate and the market exchange rate the kind of cash exchange rate um, at about five maybe seven percent so it's 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 uh, pretty amazing because in 2014, 2015, when Ukraine was attacked uh, and then Crimea was annexed and Ukraine was attacked in the east of Ukraine, we did have a bank run. We lost uh, half of the banks. They collapsed. Uh, we, our inflation went up to 60% at some point and the currency devalued uh, maybe two thirds of it. So we now we, we're still keeping in the uh, central bank reserves. So this is on the more or less micro level, and though I'm talking about the banking system. On the macro level, we expect the GDP to collapse between 35 to 45 percent. 35 is the IMF, the IMF assessment. 45 is the uh, World Bank assessment. However, it's really difficult to understand what it means because the measures, the standard measures of GDP, are not applicable during the war time. So the economy, even the demand structure, has changed, and the supply structure has changed. I, I'll just give two examples to try to illustrate the point I'm making. One is. Okay, look at me, for example. My salary now is cut five times, but I'm probably working twice as much as before. Doesn't mean that I'm producing, you know, in monetary terms, I'm being paid. Doesn't mean that my value added is 50% of 20% uh, what it was before the war. Probably not. Probably it went up. And then in terms of production, I'm not teaching, you know, um, talking, you know, having the privilege and the luxury of talking to you here on Zoom is perhaps as, as normal as it ever gets for me in these uh, times. Most of the other time I'm spent, you know, today you see I'm in a t-shirt, a militaristic t-shirt, and I was shipping uh, 30 pickup trucks this morning together with mayor of Lviv and the local governor of the uh, military uh, administration to the front lines. And so, you know, I'm a professor, you know, I'm doing some other things, which uh, probably if measured in the monetary terms, uh, might be as high as what my salary was before, if not higher, but you can't pick it up by any kind of real GDP assessment price because you know the, the structure of production has truly changed and demand as well. So, so, so I think that then the right way to, to think about what's happening is whether we have uh, uh, logistics to import and export what we need, whether we have um, infrastructure working, whether people are employed and have actual jobs to do, and whether they have, uh, you know, salaries are being paid and uh, they have shelter and housing and food. And on all of these um, statistics, I think we're doing quite well, provided that we have uh, six to eight million people internally displaced people and uh, over eight million, according to some estimates, the largest estimates of people who are refugees outside the country. Um, but even there, about 80% of people are saying that they would like to come back at the first, very first opportunity. The gas stations, you know, have gas. I checked the exchange, uh, the, the currency exchange booth operate, uh, operational food is there. 
um, payments are made uh, and people have jobs. Not everyone, but you know, at least two thirds of the businesses are operational, and uh, some are even hiring more. So it's amazing that this is happening. But we truly have a problem with um, two problems. One is logistics. Uh, that in the west of uh, um, in the west of Ukraine, um, uh, we 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 have difficulty. Um, we have difficulty exporting things. So we really have uh, a lot of. Um, a lot of um, uh, goods which has been stored, uh, for example, agriculture. We have been suppliers of the. Uh, we have been suppliers of uh, about 11 percent of wheat, of total uh, world markets of wheat, and um, and uh, the harvest is really sitting in storages in Ukraine. So we're having a paradox. We're gonna uh, we're gonna have the uh, crop uh, rotting. And at the same time, we will have um, we will have a food crisis, a food security crisis, because we cannot export. So the ports have to be deblocated, either through the United Nations or through something else. And um, uh, you know, there should be a way to start exporting through Odessa. And the second one is fiscal needs, immediate fiscal needs of the budget uh, of Ukraine. It's between five to eight billion dollars. And if they are not met, uh, and there's a lot of work being done to, for them to be met, but if they are not met, then it, uh, it, uh, you know, it poses the risk of macroeconomic stability in Ukraine. Again, I, I want to, you know, I can stress enough that this is a miracle that there is macroeconomic stability in Ukraine during the two months of war. Uh, but we're running a little bit on the kind of credibility reserve of the central bank and of the government. And if these fiscal needs are not uh, met sufficiently soon, and the commitments which have been promised or made uh, by the international community uh, are realized, um, then you know this uh, relatively rosy picture might change. Uh, but the, the work is being done, and um, the government, together with the international community, are uh, working out specific mechanisms to meet those needs. To meet those needs. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, very much. Uh, Maxim, could you clarify what's going on in Russia for us, please? Oh, we can't hear you, Maxim, for some reason. How about now? Now it's good, yeah. Okay. Yes, well, first of all, thank you for uh, having me today. I'll uh, try and uh, share what I understand where the Russian economy is going now. I will mostly focus on, uh, on sanctions because I believe this is now the biggest factor and actually even the biggest surprise for the Russian economy because I would say that uh, before the war started, probably nobody would have predicted that the West would come up with uh, such a substantial comprehensive uh, packet of sanctions. Uh, so they, these can be kind of analyzed in three uh, categories, financial sanctions, uh, sanctions that limit international trade, they're called trade or sectoral sanctions, then individual sanctions. I'll probably not have much to say about the latter category. So surprisingly, 37 advanced economies have coordinated their uh, sanctions campaign on Russia. I mean, this is totally without precedent. I don't think Switzerland, for instance, have... Uh, ever been involved in sanctions effort like that. Um, the other thing I should probably preface this by saying that sanctions are evolving very fast. So uh, some things we can predict, but you know, it, the, the situation is very fluid and will change. So what I would like to do is to try and give a, a, the vision as I see it today, what would be the effect of sanctions. And here, of course, we have to distinguish substantially between short-term effects and long-term effects. So let me start with financial sanctions. I guess uh, the one biggest surprise that happened was the freezing of the uh, International Reserve of the Central Bank of Russia. This is a really a very uh, harsh measure, something that has been used very infrequently, if at all. My understanding is that even when the United States was leaving Afghanistan, uh, they did not sanction the Afghan Central Bank, essentially leaving the uh, reserves there for the uh, incoming uh, horses. So about probably somewhere between 300 and 400 billion uh, dollars, uh, more than a half of the total reserves were uh, 
free, were frozen. Uh, and that was a total surprise. Um, in addition to that, financial sanctions, a lot of, uh, I would say most major Russian banks like Sberbank and most private banks were sanctioned. And uh, many other banks were also, uh, uh, they were prohibited from using the SWIFT uh, system, which facilitates international payment. Uh, so the initial, uh, the initial impact on the economy was quite dramatic. The, the ruble exchange rate, which is probably the indicator that everybody is watching most, uh, the ruble has collapsed from something like about 70 dollars per, 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 sorry, 70 rubles per dollar to something about like 120. But the central bank, uh, we have to give uh, kind of some credit to them. They've uh, uh, introduced some measures that uh, effectively uh, curtail these uh, short-term effects. They've uh, increased the interest rate from about 9.5% before the war to initially 20%. Now it's down to 17%, but that's still a very, very high interest rate, meaning that the credits are not flowing into the economy. Um, they have introduced capital controls. So the ruble is no longer uh, a uh, kind of freely convertible currency and that has important implications. And of course, they've started um, increasing ruble liquidity. Uh, so Russia didn't really uh, have much bank runs. There were some uh, lines for the ATM machines, but fairly quickly, the, uh, the, the, the situation was stabilized. That of course, uh, does not mean that there is no, uh, that, that, that this is the end of the effect. There are substantial costs to this financial sanctions. One is that there will be uh, high inflation in this, uh, this year. IMF currently estimates it, and I think the Russian government to it something like 21% on an annual basis. I think that, you know, it may well be uh, uh, higher than that because you know, the situation is very uh, fluid. I think it's also very important that dollar is no longer available to, uh, uh, to, to people in Russia. It used to be a, an important inflation hedge when Russia faced high inflation, people used to buy a lot of dollars and, and that basically was a very convenient way to uh, limit the impact of inflation. Of inflation. That's no longer uh, available. Uh, substantially because the, there are limits on how much uh, dollars can be uh, converted or how much cash dollars can be taken out of, of the bank accounts. And it also looks like uh, the central bank will keep a very tight um, control of the, uh, of the uh, exchange rate. Russia is uh, on the verge of a sovereign default. That's uh, a separate complicated topic. I would not uh, go into that in long uh, um, I will not give a, a long discussion of that, but Russia uh, didn't have a default on its foreign debt since 1917. Uh, and of course, the, the other fundamental effect of all this is that Russia, both private and public sector, has been eff effectively cut off from the international financial markets. So international funding is no longer available for businesses. Let me turn to sectoral and trade sanctions that are a little bit harder to understand. But I think that in the medium and long term, they will be as, as important, even if, if not more. And the, to understand their impact, first of all, it's important to, remind, uh, to remember that Russia is actually a very open economy. Uh, economists measure uh, openness by dividing the sum of uh, exports and imports that the country, of a country's international trade to GDP. So for Russia, this indicator foreign trade to GDP is about 55%. For comparison, China is about 40 and US is actually under 30%. So Russia is very dependent on the world, uh, Russia's economy. Russia exports mostly oil and gas, some metals and other commodities, but the imports are mostly high value added good. There is a lot of machinery, appliances, instruments, uh, stuff like pharmaceuticals, uh, et cetera. So, so far the effects on exports have been uh, relatively small. I guess the, uh, the role of energy sanctions have been front page news on most newspapers. So I wouldn't go into that in much detail, but I would be happy to 
uh, to answer questions if they, if there are. Of course, this is very important, the uh, uh, energy experts, because they are really the core of the federal budget. More than 50% of uh, federal revenues are related to energy exports. And as long as energy exports keep flowing out of Russia and uh, dollars or euros keep going into Russia, the federal budget will be in, in relatively good shape. But imports are falling rapidly due to the sectoral sanctions and also due to the Western firms withdrawing from Russia, which uh, basically is an indicator they don't see a way of uh, operating uh, in Russia in the, in, in, uh, during the war. And we don't really know when and how and if they will return. And that has larger repercussions. I mean, these are of course very kind of sectoral things. So I would not go into too much. Let me just give you one example. So one of the largest Russian uh, production uh, companies after us that produces cars had to stop production, I believe, in the beginning of March, maybe in the middle of March, because of the lack of spare parts. And now the owner and the operator of the of this plant, which is the French company Renault, has basically decided that they want to sell the stake, their stake for effectively one ruble. So they're talking to the Russian government of who would be the new owner. And that is something that has already stopped. I mean, another uh, prominent example is uh, civil aviation. So Russian carriers, well, first of all, they cannot fly out of the country because European skies and US skies are closed for them. But the other part was that uh, Russia does not produce its own uh, uh, passenger planes. So most of the planes are either owned, but there are also a lot of leased planes that Russian carriers operate. And uh, the leasing companies were forced to terminate these contracts. Russia introduced a law kind of uh, grabbing them back but the problem is that even if they uh, kind of physically have control over these airplanes, they don't control, they don't have enough spare parts to service them. They don't. So it's very likely that they will either have to rely on some sort of gray markets for these uh, uh, spare parts or that these planes would uh, very soon stop flying. Now, um, so that just gives you a flavor of how this. Uh, um, uh, sectoral trade sanctions are already working. And of course, these effects will be uh, cumulative. Now, the, the macro outlook for this year is that the industrial production by government estimates will be down by about 11%. IMF estimates that uh, GDP will be down by about 9%. Government, the government actually even says that it may, the, the worst case scenario is something like 12%. We really don't know. There are short-term indicators that point to uh, steeper declines. Um, but uh, it's very clear that Russia economy is going south and that this is a very substantial hit. And I would say that at the moment we can probably, uh, we can probably uh, estimate that most of this is on Russian consumers and many private businesses. But until the energy experts are uh, stopped or reduced, federal budget will not be um, hit so much. And I believe that this can actually help us to try and form kind of a realistic expectations of what sanctions will and will not achieve. I would say that most likely sanctions on their own will not uh, win the war for Ukraine and for the West. That's what the Ukrainian military will have to do. But in the long run, I think that the sanctions effect will be very profound. They will be driving Russia in the direction of autarky. And this will, shall I say, just suffocate the, the, the economy. I mean, if sanctions remain in place for at least a couple of years or maybe more, I think this will lead to a dramatic reduction in the standard of living. It will also reduce the country's production potential. This in turn, in the long run, will materially limit Russia's capabilities to wage wars. Thank you. Muted. You're muted. I don't Thank you very it. much, Maxime. Um, Marlis, take us a little yeah. further back from the exact conflict and give us a better sense for how the world at large is going to be affected, please. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks very much uh, for the invitation to, to speak uh, on such an important topic. Um, I'm a specialist on, on Africa. I'm an African historian. So um, the perspective I'll be bringing in, in part, is kind of like how I think about the long run pattern uh, and the shock in that in that light. So I think the first thing I would like to put on the on the table is, of course, that Africa is a very diverse continent, um, many different countries. And if we're thinking, um, for example, in terms of um, the natural resources that it has, it's, it becomes very clear that these countries are going to be affected uh, differentially. Um, so that's not just mineral resources, but also in terms of what they're producing and consuming um, in terms of agricultural staple crops. Um, on top of that, they have very different histories. Um, there's a shared history of colonial rule, but there was, of course, quite a lot of variation in the nature um, uh, and ties that have survived from that. Um, it has um, a great variation in the experience of the Cold War era, so um, different alliances um, that have shaped um, political ties um, in the region. The second thing um, I think that um, is, is helpful to think about how this affects Africa is that the continent um, is ex uh, in a moment of um, rapid population growth and urbanization. Uh, historically, Africa has always been very sparsely populated. Land was historically abundant, labor was scarce. And what we've been seeing basically since the mid 20th century is that the African population has been growing uh, rapidly. Um, uh, this is expected to continue until the end of the 21st century. So just kind of for proportions, like right now, about 11 of the world's population is living in sub-Saharan Africa. By 2100, 40% of world population will be living in sub-Saharan Africa. And if we're thinking about this um, transition process that is ongoing in the region, um, I think it helps us understand better the, um, um, the impact of um, ongoing crisis elsewhere um, economically. Um, land has become increasingly scarce uh, in the region. Um, and um, as a re result of that, many countries that were originally um, uh, able to sustain themselves in terms of food production have now become a net importer of, um, uh, of cereals, um, of which wheat is one of them. Um, at the same time, um, I think what is um, another very important development that's related to this is that um, whereas the continent for, for basically for centuries has always been very externally oriented, so external, I mean, outside of the continent, um, heavy dependence uh, in terms of its commercial relationships, especially with the Western world, which has diversified more, of course, in the post-colonial period. Um, but what we're seeing um, uh, on the continent at this moment as um, uh, basically these markets are growing denser, population is settling in higher numbers, um, is that we're seeing that domestic markets are deepening um, and that African countries very deliberately and very proactively are investing uh, in deepening their commercial ties within the continent. So kind of turning away to, to some extent um, from this very heavy dependence on, um, uh, on other parts of the world. And the third thing um, I would say is that um, we, if we're thinking about less about the kind of long durée trends and more about where the continent is right now, or many countries on the continent, um, many countries are still recovering from COVID um, and, and the economic impact of that. Um, and um, there has also been in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa an intensification of food insecurity, especially in conflict zones. Um, so this is kind of like the, the more short term context in which um, the ripple effects, the economic ripple effects of the Ukraine war are um, hitting the continent. Um, so, yeah, those are kind of like, I think, the main um, uh, developments um, uh, as we see um, kind of like the, the kind of the context, the short run and long run context in which this takes place. I think that um, if we're thinking about the economic effects of the war, I think we can distinguish between a number of short run and long run um, developments. So the first ones are quite obvious, like these short run spikes in commodity prices, um, especially of um, wheat um, that is imported by a number of countries um, uh, on the continent. And of course, spikes in oil prices, which um, is beneficial, of course, for those oil exporters on the continent, such as Nigeria, um, uh, but that hit oil importing countries uh, much harder. Um, uh, the same kind of related to that is that um, already on top 
of the COVID pandemic, um, there is now another round of disruptions in supply chains um, uh, that come with this. Um, and I think that there are kind of more political aspects to this as well. This moment in time um, really kind of forces African countries in these kind of large voting um, uh, moments in international arena to think hard about where their political alliances are at this moment and um, how they want to position themselves politically or in kind of geopolitical conflicts. And then finally, something in the short run that I think is, is a bit more overlooked, but um, there were quite a number of African students, thousands of them um, in Ukraine when the conflict um, erupted that had to be repatriated um, and that had uh, that have experienced a very um, difficult exit. Um, and uh, many of them have spoken about, um, um, you know, horrific incidents of racism on their way out, um, uh, that they have not been received and helped in the same way. So I think those are a number of these kind of short run immediate effects that are felt. And then in terms of the long run effects, um, I think that one of the big concerns really would be the, the, the slowdown of the global economy, which um, often leads to capital flight from um, uh, emerging markets. Um, I think uh, if we're thinking about um, some other kind of economic impacts is, uh, for example, um, the dependence of many African countries still on the imports of fertilizers. Um, so, because that will affect um, food prices in the longer run, and especially as the continent is growing in population size, um, and is already become has already become dependent on uh, the import uh, of grains, um, they are in the midst of trying to develop greater capacity to produce fertilizers, uh, but are still de dependent on this. And I think if their dependence uh, on either Russia or Ukraine. Um, uh, is large, it's probably in, in fertilizers. I mean, the shares of, um, you know, total imports coming from, um, from wheat are relatively small. Um, and the shares of that coming from Russia or Ukraine are, with some notable exceptions, not um, uh, that overwhelmingly large. It's also a continent that has a lot of local crops that it can substitute with. Um, so we're thinking, for example, about um, their stories of uh, bakeries in Cameroon switching um, uh, from producing uh, bread um, from flour, uh, from wheat flour to cassava flour or sweet potato flour. Um, so those are uh, some of the kind of long run um, trends. And I, I think that if anything, it, it, this moment is, a, is, is definitely a moment of challenge uh, for the continent, but it may also kind of strengthen that process of um, increasingly turning to internal or continental solutions. So it might stimulate greater trade and reliance on imports from neighboring countries. We see that growing shares of uh, trade of African countries with each other um, uh, are there. Um, there are net exporters, um, uh, especially in North Africa of fertilizers. Um, so it could boost capacity and, you know, uh, diversify the dependence to some degree. So those are some of the, the largest trends that um, uh, came to mind um, uh, when you asked me uh, to uh, share my reflections on the economic effects of the common. Thank you, Marlis. Could I just ask one quick follow up question, which is, are there um, certain, certain countries that you're particularly concerned about that will be hit much harder than than others? Yeah, I mean, we could think, for example, um, about Egypt, um, where um, that's really a lar fairly large importer of wheat, um, about, uh, if I look at the 2020 data, um, about 7% um, of exports uh, is wheat. Um, and most of that is coming was coming from Russia, about 60% from Russia, another 25% um, uh, from Ukraine. Now, if we're, for example, uh, like Nigeria is another uh, relatively large importer of wheat, about 4% in 2020, of which a quarter came from Russia. Um, not much, I think, believe from uh, Ukraine, the second largest order uh, is Lithuania. Um, and um, uh, the DRC, I mean, I'm really thinking here about the, lar the largest population sizes here. Um, another importer of wheat, 2%, um, about 60% of that came from Russia. So um, in, in terms of countries that would feel these immediate effects, um, that's probably the largest uh, importers of, uh, of grains. Um, and uh, their net importers 
of grains in total. So um, food prices will be will be felt pretty quickly. And the question really is like, which share of the population um, is experiencing this? Because um, wheat is especially consumed by um, uh, in urban centers. Um, so it's it's not at all clear to me that those regions most at risk for food security, which are really in conflict zones, whether most of the, the wheat imports are going to those regions. Um, um, I would I, I'm not quite sure um, what what the main staples are that are being consumed there, but um, rising prices overall for cereals are certainly um, not good for um, countries where there is general uh, food insecurity and growing food insecurity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's um let let's stay on this question of agricultural exports for a second. Um, and I wanted to follow up with uh, Tim about uh, the importance of opening the ports in Odessa in order to facilitate Ukrainian exports. Do you have a sense for for whether or not that's realistic? And if not, are there other ways to export? Let's say the uh, the wheat that's in storage there, or is it basically just blocked in Odessa? All right. So yeah, there is wheat and. Um corn which is there and also sunflower and sunflower oil and um, ukraine actual top uh, provider or top exporter of the world and about five of the top 10 grains um, five million tons of wheat uh, 10 to 16 million tons of uh, corn this, this is a lot this is really a lot um, can we export it not through odessa well the other option is through train and connections with uh, poland predominantly. Now that route is congested right now for obvious reasons, because, uh, uh, okay, supplies come in this way, but it's still congested, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had 70% of experts going through Odessa. It's probably possible to increase, you know, the capacity by 40, 50, you know, 100%. Um, the railway expert capacity in the short period of time, but it still won't bring uh, you know, the needed volumes of expert. So we're looking at uh, a lot of this uh, harvest simply sitting and rotting and waiting for Odessa to be open. The other ways for Odessa to be deblocated, you know, there could be creative ways like United Nations, um, humanitarian food security convoys where the ships... Uh, under United Nations leadership are coming to Odessa. Um, you know, the Black Sea doesn't belong to Russia. It doesn't belong to Ukraine. These are international waters. And so when Russia is blockading international waters and shooting at the ships and cargo ships, which are trying to transport goods, food, to other countries, that's an attack uh, not just on Ukraine. Um, finally, I just want to point out that uh, there are official documents by Russian MPs which authorize confiscation of harvest in Kherson Oblast, dated yesterday, I think, on April 27th, where uh, um, they will be taking some of the harvest that they can, you know, get hold on for domestic cons consumption in Kras Krasnodar region because they have shortages there. And um, so they are also still in some of this harvest, uh, harvest which is stored um, in Ukraine. Um, the second part of the equation of the question is whether we are able to, you know, there's uh, planting you know, sowing season right now. Uh, we expect that we'll be able to plant about 70% of the land, but not all 100. So it's not zero either. Um, the harvest will be there. And we will be able to supply, uh, but uh, we really need Odessa to be deblocated. Russia has three strategic economic weapons. One is energy. We have all seen it and discussed it. The second one is not as prominently debated in the media or in academic discussions. That is logistics, because uh, northern China trades with Europe through Russia or through railroads, connections. Some of them going through Ukraine too, by the way. So that's shut down as well and destabilized the entire region. And the third one is uh, food security. Ukraine provides food security for about 385 million people. 
uh, if Russia is going to be able to strategically block Ukraine and kick it out from this market, it will become a local monopolist. And so it will acquire another weapon on top of uh, already existing potential issues with food security. So it will be able to use it to destabilize politically certain countries or put pressure on them or have more leverage. And this is uh, is strategically problematic for Middle East, for Northern Africa, for some Asian countries, and, and of course for the EU. Sorry, Timofey, I just lost you there for the end of your sentence. Northern Africa, the Middle East. Uh, and the EU. Uh, yeah. yeah, Asia and the EU. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like another energy weapon, but now you can expand the, you know, kind of, and you can do the dynamics of, you know, shipping things to one country, not the other one, leverage, and, you know, you get okay. leverage. Yeah. So let me then turn to Maxime. Um, you know, given that the the Russian government must now be thinking pretty hard about what it's going to do if there is an oil embargo, for example, or if there is a reduction in the amount of natural gas that Europe is willing to consume, uh, are they? Is the government at the point where they're considering alternative uh, strategies for income, like increasing agricultural imports? Um, or something else. I mean, it, it seems to me quite a lot of the food was being imported anyway. So is there even the capacity to replace Ukrainian imports in, in let's say, the medium term? Well, I cannot speak for the government. Uh, my right. sense <laughs> is that uh, since 2014, uh, Russia has made a substantial progress in substituting food imports with uh, domestic production. So my understanding is that this probably is not a, a primary concern, the, the um, decline in, in food imports. Mm-hmm. That Russian mozzarella is flying off the shelves. Uh, yeah, also <laughs> I'm not sure that mozzarella is such an important commodity for uh, most Russians. Although I have seen, I have seen images of, um, you know, anti-theft devices placed on baby food and cheese in the grocery stores. Yeah, no, obviously there there are some goods that may be hard to to substitute. I'm not Mm -hmm. sure about baby food. And of course, you know, cheese, cheese may also be be a problem. But overall, I, I, I think that kind of a net, Russia is probably a net exporter of food rather than an importer. So I'm not saying that this would not be a problem, but probably it would. But in my uh, my hunch would be that this would not be the biggest problem that the government would face if right. if indeed the, uh, the, the oil and gas experts are uh, sanctioned or reduced. So I want to uh, to go back to something that both uh, Tim and Maxime touched on, which is the estimates of how much GDP will fall. All right, Tim, you pointed out that there's a lot of activity that is productive that's not going to be measured in the numbers, right? So it's difficult to, to know by how much GDP will fall. I wonder, Maxime, if the same is true of the Russian numbers, that in fact, there's a lot of, of activity that is not going to happen that hasn't yet been estimated and in including in those figures. So that the, the Ukrainian number might be overestimating the decline and the Russian numbers might be underestimating them for essentially the same reason that people are now doing something else that's not measured or they're doing nothing that's not measured. Well, I, I, I would imagine that, of course, you, with an with the external shock like this one, uh, some of the Russian economy will move uh, into the kind of gray area, uh, would, um, you know, would, would, would become informal. We know that, you know, as economies grow, firms come out of the informal sector, and that has all sorts of positive effects. But when the economies start contracting, as Russia is starting, um, uh, I think many, many, many firms will probably uh, start moving in that in that direction. We have to wait and see uh, uh, what, what will actually be happening. I, I believe there is also a, a more fundamental problem with the, with the, uh, estimating, uh, with kind of uh, evaluating these Russian numbers. There is no, uh, it's not entirely clear to what extent the numbers remain uh, remain accurate. I think there have been some concerns that. Uh, 
if numbers are kind of entirely cooked, but they're adjusted here and there. So I, I, I just look at these numbers as very kind of rough guesses of where the economy will be at the end of this year. Uh, I, I would be surprised if the real number is less than, uh, than of, of decline in industrial production and, and GDP is less than 10%, but I think it can potentially be uh, more, more substantial. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to get to the question of human capital, and I know Tim wants to talk about this when he comes back. Um, but Marlis, let me start with you. You know, one of the interesting questions is that both Ukraine and Russia are at the risk of losing uh, highly uh, sophisticated and educated human capital through uh, refugees, either uh, forced or or by choice, as in the case of Russia. And yet, when you talk about the increase in that population growth in Africa, it suggests that they are not going to have you know, any kind of crunch on human capital. Is that, is that the way you see it? Or is it, is it a problem of the number of people versus what they're actually able to do and the training that they, they're going to be able to get? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, if we're thinking about um, the, 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 the overall levels of education in Sub-Saharan Africa, those have grown dramatically um, over the last century. Um, literacy rates and, and basic forms of education. Um, it is true, though, that um, I think um, lots of African governments have very limited fiscal capacity. I mean, we're really talking here about maybe 10 to 15 percent of GDP. Um, and with a growing population, especially a very young population, um, which does not pay uh, taxes yet, right? Like the, depend like the dependency ratio is basically going, going up. Um, and uh, it will be a challenge um, to pay for um, uh, for these education systems. Um, that said, um, uh, lots has been achieved. I think um, uh, that should not be um, discarded. It's like it is. Um, uh, people are remarkably more, you know, have much higher levels uh, of education overall. Um, I think that um, one challenge that many countries have is not just um, in providing primary education, but also to make sure that um, there are significant investments in secondary and tertiary education to equip uh, people with those skills needed um, uh, to really flourish in um, uh, the kind of the economies of the 21st century uh, and to be able to leapfrog technologies um, uh, uh, in the decades ahead. Mm -hmm. Maxime, uh, we were talking yesterday about uh, the fact that so many highly trained, highly skilled Russians are leaving Russia, um, going sometimes to Europe, sometimes to other uh, former, former Soviet countries like Armenia and uh, Kazakhstan and Georgia, also Poland, obviously, and uh, Lithuania. Um, what are you seeing or hearing about the brain drain? And how do you think that that loss of, of some of the best and the brightest in Russia is going to impact the Russian economy in the longer term? Um, yeah, I actually think this is a very big thing that is going on now. If I, I limited my comments mostly to sanctions, but if I were had the time to talk about two topics, probably brain drain would be my, my, my I think the second most important. Uh, we don't really have any hard data, at least I'm not aware of any hard data of what's going on, but, I, but the estimates that you see would probably place the number of people that have left Russia since the war, triggered by the, by, by the war, somewhere like between maybe half a million uh, or more. And uh, um, just, you know, by, by what you see, uh, and what you learn about, it's very clear that this are uh, kind of the, the young, the best, the brightest, the most mobile uh, people who work in like high tech sector, et cetera, uh, who have the human capital that they believe they can take with this. I mean, leaving Russia is not, is not easy now. Uh, you know, you will find that your uh, uh, credit cards don't work or debit cards don't work, Visa cards, MasterCards don't work outside of the country. Uh, and difficult for perhaps many, many other reasons. I, I, and until recently, I understand that Europe was not that welcoming. I, uh, my sense is that Germany has uh, changed its policy recently, but I have not yet uh, uh, confirmed that. So there is a lot of, uh, a lot of people have been moving to places like Istanbul, like Yerevan, capital of Armenia, or Tbilisi, capital 
of Georgia, perhaps some other places where, where they can go without uh, without visas. But frankly, you know, most of these people were not really preparing a move, and they feel that they have to move in the in the circus. And I believe that this is like a huge hit for the Russian economy. Again, that is not something that uh, will. Uh, be uh, will have an immediate impact, but in terms of long-term potential, long-term growth potential, long-term development, I mean, this is this is really uh, terrible, and uh, I think that it's it would be very hard to uh, uh, see these people come back until the the situation in the country changes dramatically. Well, we've been we've been talking about the Russian economy's uh, failure to restructure for at least thirty years now, right? And the dependence on uh, energy exports remains very high. As you said, it's about the taxes on the uh, energy exports are about fifty percent of the federal budget revenue. Um, and every time there has been a crisis, like in nineteen ninety eight, for example, in two thousand eight, people say, "Great, you know, now the economy is going to have to restructure." because it obviously can't continue the way it's continuing and it never happens. Like, do you think that there's some prospect for that happening now? And if so, you know, what are the other possible sectors outside of commodities that are available to develop on a reasonably quick timeline? Uh, look, I, I think uh, the question is more like a long-term question and there are many scenarios that are possible depending on, you know, what, uh, what will, uh, uh, happen with the sanctions, etc. But as I, as I said, the if the sanctions remain in place for at least several years, then I think that would really force Russia to uh, uh, change very dramatically because it's very reliant on a on the international economy. It has this trade where it exports commodities and imports a lot of high value goods, and you know the. It's it's uh, the the Russian private sector is like a genuine private sector. There, there will be a lot of restructuring, and firms will enter into new uh, into new industries, and perhaps there will be new production. But you know, high uh, high tech goods like I, I I do not expect Russia to start you know producing airplanes. Uh, there, there there is some production uh, of, of Sukhoi airplanes, but this is highly reliant on Western avionics, perhaps Western engines, etc. And that is that that is really impossible to uh, to do in the immediate. So that's that's a big hit, and I think that uh, whatever the restructuring will happen to adjust to this new reality will not necessarily be a positive one. Russia has been a big big beneficiary of international trade, and if that stops. The, uh, the consequences, the long run consequences will be very dramatic. Tim, let me uh, catch you up on the, the two questions that, that we addressed, right? So one is the question of um, whether this war and this crisis will finally drive Russia to restructure its economy away from commodities. Um, and I would ask the same question for Ukraine. Do you anticipate a, a shift in the composition of economic activity as a result of the war? And the question before that, which I know you want to answer, is that of human capital. What is the impact of the war on human capital and what can be done in order to preserve it? Um, and um, we have four minutes. So four minutes for those two small questions. You're muted, by the way. Yeah, apologies, I disappeared. It's no um, challenging sometimes in Ukraine. But um, okay, so uh, restructuring of uh, the Ukrainian economy, absolutely, it's happening already. So we should uh, not be surprised that it is a war economy, um, much more coordinated, at least at the front line. So everything which has to do with manufacturing, heavy machinery industry requires the government support in terms of supply chains, logistics, um, protection, you know, we are not talking about it publicly, but critical enterprises now being protected by air defense. So, you know, we, we have to, we have very scarce air defense and we have to allocate it between the critical infrastructure, critical industries, and of course the front lines and then population centers. Uh, but as things improve, uh, uh, but you'll see how there will be gravity uh, in that way. Uh, a lot of innovation is happening in, in high tech, in IT, but also in terms of just production in military, especially in drones, in intelligence, in artificial intelligence for identification. So all of those will have commercial applications because they're going to be military tested right now. 
Um, and we already see some investments. Just today, I had some uh, calls with uh, a major domestic uh, semi-oligarchic company, and they were interested in uh, what kind of military equipment and uh, new opportunities they can invest right now to support them right, uh, you know, during the war, but uh, later develop it internationally. Um, so there will be a restructuring of that type, and it also will be driven by logistics, or so much more medium, medium, uh, higher value added uh, businesses uh, rather than large ones, because they're more robust and more resilient to the war uh, threats. Um, on the uh, Russian economy, I think the answer here is really depend connected with the politics and uh, we'll see how this war develops what kind of uh, political responses will be depending on the results of this war and i think as it's going to be prone so i think the the restructuring is needed there'll be an attempt to double down and uh, protect the economy and substitute it will be unlikely i agree with maxim here um, to be successful so you know but there is a bigger game here. On the human capital, human capital flight is happening both from Ukraine and from Russia. Um, this is detrimental to the future of this region overall. Uh, we are working very, very hard on uh, keeping the scholars, academics, uh, analysts in Ukraine, providing them with salaries, with jobs, with uh, scholarships. Uh, I encourage all of you to check out kec.ua and donate. Um, in particular, in support of academics. Some of the universities in the US will be making announcements of major uh, major gifts to Ukrainian universities through KEC, but hopefully also, you know, more broadly. Um, so human capital is, is, is a fundamental issue. I don't want to have a country like Ukraine winning and left uh, with uh, very limited human capital. We want uh, smart people to drive the future of the region, of the country, and of the countries around. There's really a lot of, at stake. Okay, we have one minute left. So let me give you a, 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 what is it called? A flash round. Is there one last thing that you would like our audience to take away from the impact of the war. Let me start with you, Marlis. Yeah, I think um, the th there is a sh like that there is a short run and a long run impact. But I think that in the in the longer run, one of the consequences for for many African countries could be that they will um, lower their dependency um, uh, on imports from from Ukraine and Russia. Thank you, Maxim. I don't know. I have only an emotional response to that. There should be no war. Okay, fair enough. And Tim, you get the last word. Yeah, I will. I just want to bring kind of up the depressing point that uh, there will be no clear end to this war. Uh, the intensity will drop. It's not even an announced war. So when the intensity will be dropped, and hopefully there will be some ceasefire with reasonable conditions, the threats of the threat of war will continue. To be there so that's going to affect uh, business and investment in the region throughout so we are really facing a new environment we have to get used to it and uh, work hard on changing it all right thank you so much both the the or all the three of you for participating in the discussion also to our audience members um, i have learned an enormous amount but not everything so i think we'll have to call you back in a few months and uh and see what's changed since then and, and what we need to know then. Thank you so much. Thank you.